Hi everyone, welcome to the last session of the uh, Baglan Community Church Discipleship Strategy. I made all the other videos, I wrote all the other chapters of the book, and something didn't feel finished. It didn't feel right to leave it where we'd left it. Because what I want to do in this video is kind of pull together really what it looks like to live as disciples of Jesus Christ. What will it actually look like in our day-to-day lives and there is a phrase that has constantly stuck in my head as to what the christian life looks like and that is to swim against the tide to be different to how the world lives to live lives that show that jesus christ is lord of our lives where it says to be you know in the bible where it says that we need to be that light to the darkness something that is radically different to everything that is around us And when we grasp this, when we live lives that show that Jesus is Lord, our lives will look so different to how the world lives. And it will be inviting to the world as well to see how radically different we are as Christians. Jesus described what it means to be a disciple in these words. And I just want to share them with you because they are quite sobering. Let me just read this to you, what Jesus said. He said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. But whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit their very self, their very soul? Jesus' original audience would know exactly what he meant when he says to take up their cross. In the Roman world, the cross was the symbol of execution. It meant that death was coming, pain was coming, torture was coming. And once someone took up their cross, they didn't put it back again. No, the Roman soldiers would make sure of that. It was a one-way ticket to death, pain, humiliation. So to pick up your cross is not something someone does for the fun of it. No, it's, it's something much more much more serious than that. But Jesus doesn't want us to take these words literally, I don't think. You know, how can someone literally be crucified daily? They can't. But what he's saying here is that we need to die to ourselves, die to our old way of living, to die to self and make Jesus Lord of every aspect of our lives, not just the bits that we want to make him Lord of, but to die to our old selves, to die to that sinful nature, to die to who we were before we came to Christ and to make him Lord of every aspect of our lives. That's what he's getting at here when he says, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily. That's what he's getting at here, that we need to die to our old self and only then will we find true life in him. And when we get this, it's going to have a dramatic impact on how we spend our time and our money. And these are two things that we're going to look at in this video a little bit, because how we spend our time and our money shows what we value most in life. Money is so, so key to this. Jesus talks about money so much in his teachings. It is crucial because how we value money and how we value our time shows us what our treasure is. And that's what we're going to zoom in on here. Yes, throughout the New Testament, Jesus is so, so clear about how as Christians we should view money, that we should not be mastered by a love for money. We see that in 1 Timothy 6 verse 10. Now that's really important. It's a love for money. We need money in the in this world. We need money so that we can afford the rent, so we can pay the gas bills, so we can put food on the table. Yes, we need to have money, but what Jesus is getting at here is a love for money when it becomes our idol in life. But money is such a big deal because it reveals what our heart desires. In Matthew 6, verse 20, uh, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So money reveals a lot about who we are on the inside. Now, 
quite often people look at Jesus's teachings and think this is just for rich people who need to be really careful about having this love for money. And it very much is for rich people, but it can apply just as much if you're poor or somewhere in the middle. Perhaps you're poor and all you want to do is be rich. And you think that that's where your satisfaction will be if you could just get more money. Or if you're very rich already and you strive after more and more stuff, and what Jesus warns is that will not satisfy and it has huge consequences in our Christian lives. So yes, a rich person can be mastered by a love for money and a poor person can be mastered by a love for money. But what they do is they demonstrate that we love money more than God. And Jesus warns us in Matthew 6, 19 to 20, that we are warned not to store up for yourselves treasures on earth, but to store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. And in Matthew 19, verse 24, Jesus also tells us that it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. In Luke chapter 12, Jesus warns us to be on guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. And he then goes on to illustrate this by telling us a parable. And he tells the parable of a man who has an abundant harvest, who brings in so much crops that he almost doesn't know what to do with it all. So what he does is he tears down his barns and he builds bigger and better barns with a view that he could live a comfortable lifestyle that he could live in prosperity with nice food on the table and that that would make him happy, that he would have his joy and satisfaction if he just had that comfortable lifestyle. But then he's rebuked by God and it's a harsh warning. And he says that on that same day, this man's gonna die. On the same day that he's gonna die. And then what's his wealth gonna do then? absolutely nothing other than perhaps get a fancy funeral. His wealth would count for nothing on that day. Jesus would take everything away from him. And the conclusion to this parable is key. Jesus is warning here and rebuking those who store up for themselves wealth on earth, treasures on earth, but are not rich towards God. It's a really harsh, really uh, in-your-face warning from Jesus. But what does it mean to be rich towards God? Well, on the one hand, it could be that we need to be giving more to charity, giving more to the poor, to, to sell our possessions and give to the poor. And I think Jesus is very clear that we should be generous with our wealth, generous with our money to those who are in need. Uh, Luke 12, 33 tells us that we need to be people who sell their possessions and give it to the poor. We are to provide purses for ourselves that will not wear out, a treasure in heaven that will never fail, where no thief comes near and no moths destroy. We are very much called to be generous with our wealth as Christians. And this is perhaps a reflection point, a discussion point if you're in house group at the moment. Maybe take some time to discuss what you do with your money. It can be a sensitive issue. Uh, But are we generous with our money to those who are in need? Because ultimately, all our wealth isn't ours. The money that you have in your bank account isn't actually yours. It belongs to God. And one day we're going to have to be accountable for how we use that money. And I'm speaking very much to myself here as much as anyone else. But we are one day going to be accountable to God for how we use our money. But there is also a deeper meaning, I believe, to what it means to be rich towards God. And we are to use our possessions, our wealth, to show that Jesus is our treasure, that he is our treasure, not the wealth itself. We are to live in such a way that shows that God is number one in our lives. And that is key when it comes to spending our money. So we are to be live. Uh, we, we are to live in such a way that shows that we are not mastered by money, but we are mastered by Christ. 
that we love Christ and we want to lay it all down at his feet because it ultimately belongs to him. So in this fallen world that we live in, we need to live in such a way that shows we have a great king, a great saviour. And true discipleship means to lay down our lives, to die to self and to live for Jesus Christ. On the screen at the moment are going to be some reflective questions. Let's just have a little look at them. And if you're in house group, perhaps you want to pause the video to discuss these questions. Or if you just want to reflect on them, that would be great. So the first one is, if someone were to observe your life 24 hours a day, what evidence would they find that your faith is genuine? If they could watch every aspect of your life, what, what evidence would they find? Are you swimming against the tides of this world or are you swimming with it? Perhaps take time as you're watching this to reflect on how you use your finances. Where do they show that your treasure is? What do you value most in life? Because how you spend your time and your money gives a massive clue as to what you treasure most. Same with your time. It's so key. Time is the most valuable gift that we can have. How do we spend our time how can we use all aspects of our life for the glory of god not just the sunday mornings but how can we spend all aspects of our lives to show that god is our treasure jesus tells us to deny ourselves and take up our cross daily in what ways are we currently doing this how can you apply this verse as you go forward in life and are there more things you could be doing with your time or your wealth that would demonstrate Christ is king in your life and help grow the kingdom of God? There's going to be a spiritual assessment on the screen. There's just six statements this time. If you want to pause the video, read through the six statements slowly, carefully, prayerfully, and give yourself a score out of five where one is never and five is always. And then reflect on the scores of the spiritual assessment. Which areas are you perhaps struggling with at the moment? What strategies uh, can you put in place to help with these? So as we conclude the discipleship strategy, I just want to suggest a few ways that we can embed this into our day-to-day -day lives. That we can live as children of God. And very, very practical measures that we can put in place so that we continue to grow in our love for Christ. And if we put these strategies in place, we will almost certainly go forward in our Christian life. There's a real danger in the Christian life that if we're not going forward, that we're probably going backwards. And we really want to avoid that. We don't want to be going backwards. So firstly, each day, make time to pray. Make time to read God's word and spend time with him. Remember, it's a relationship. We talked about how important that relationship aspect of it is, that we need to make time to be with our father, to enjoy reading his word, to soak in it, and to pray to him. Have a good Christian book or a podcast on the go, something that you can really get your teeth into that's going to encourage you and build you up in your Christian walk. If you're not sure, of anything particularly good, perhaps ask one of the leadership team for some recommendations, uh, but really spend some time getting into good Christian literature, listening to good sermons and soaking in God's word. Make sure that you are committed to a house group. If you're watching this and you're not in a house group, I really, really urge you just to get involved with that, to be part of the fellowship and family that we have here in Baglan. Find ways to serve in a church ministry. It's so important to be giving in church and not just taking. And then seek opportunities to tell other people the gospel. We've seen how incredible the gospel is. This gospel that saves us from our sins because of the blood of Jesus Christ and has purchased for us eternal life with him. It is too good a news to keep to ourselves. We've got to be people who seek after telling others the gospel. If all of these things are in place, I am certain that we will grow in our Christian lives, that we will grow in our love for Christ. If they're not in place, growth might be slow. Growth might be inconsistent. So my prayer for us all is that we would continue to grow in our love 
for Jesus Christ. I hope this discipleship strategy has been helpful. And I just want to close by praying for us all. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for what you've done for us, dying on the cross to purchase us as your people, to save us from our sins. Oh, we can never thank you enough. But Lord, we want to be people who lay down our lives at the foot of the cross, who have died to self and taken up this new life. That we're people who are willing to carry our cross every day. That we would die to self and live for you, for your glory, in your mighty name. Amen.